this one. I'm trying to make a recording of me talking about the presentation because we've had lots of requests, but it requires multiple apps. Um, anyway, okay, here we are. All right, everyone. Um, so while um, we definitely encourage questions and clarifying um, uh, comments, um, if you could um, hold some of those until the end, or if it's a burning question or comment, Sneha is going to be tracking the comments um, or the uh, chat in the group. And that is just for time management, because we have a lot to cover today. And I just want to make sure that we get through it. Um, so I just really appreciate everyone logging in. I know it's spring break and a lot of folks have kids at home anyway, because of COVID. Um, we are going to be looking through the action effectiveness monitoring and research uh, results for 2019. And um, Sneha and I are going to be presenting this and we're going to be going back and forth. So first, I don't know if you can see, this is a beautiful uh, photo of a Wapato flower. And on this flower is, I think I counted like 12 little flies. So um, this is, you know, diptera. It's one of salmon's favorite food. And so we, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, I always love it when I can see these, you know, these habitats, you know, doing, doing this work that we expect of them. And this is at Steamboat Slough. So because it's such a long presentation today, and I don't know if we're going to get to the very end, which I really hope that we do, I wanted to go ahead and just thank everybody up front because we have all these research partners and we do not do this work in a vacuum. And um, it's just so important that we um, acknowledge that all, you know, it takes a village to collect all these data and we are really, really grateful. Um, this is April, April Silva. April and Narayan with Crest are, um, you know, they ha help us, they've been helping us for years and years collecting AMER and um, e ecosystem monitoring data. And so we're just, um, you know, we're very grateful to them. But then of course, everyone else who has also helped us. And um, I see that many of you have logged in today. So thank you very much. Um, okay, just a quick overview, um, just a little bit about the Action Effectiveness Monitoring Program that we lead here at the Lower Columbia, um, and then we're going to talk about the sites that we surveyed in 2019, in 2020, and in 2021, which we are going to be doing this summer. And then um, we're going to go in depth on some highlights for the 2019 results. And these results were published in August, and um, there's an extensive report. So if any time um, during this presentation you're like, oh, she's missing something, or you know they're not covering everything, I want to know more, please uh, go to the link, and you can download the full report, and all of the information is in there. And uh, we're really proud of it. We were actually, I'm, I was looking through it, getting ready for this presentation. I was just shocked how much we were able to do um, during COVID. Um, you know, this we actually did most of this work right after lockdown happened. So I'm really grateful to Sneha and the team for, for helping with that. After we go through all of this, we're going to have a group discussion um, about those questions we talked about, adaptive management, triggers, uh, thresholds. I think these are really important ongoing conversations that we need to have as a group. All right, so the Columbia Estuary Ecosystem Restoration Program um, this is the program that um, the action effectiveness monitoring that we do is part of. Um, and these objectives that I've listed up here are the objectives of the uh, restoration program and of the restoration projects. So increasing the capacity and quality of estuarine and tidal fluvial ecosystems, increasing the opportunity for access uh, by aquatic organisms to and for export of materials um, from these shallow water habitats, and then improve ecosystem um, realized function for uh, juvenile salmonids. Now, a lot of you talked about how you want to know how we're doing in terms of these objectives, and I think those are amazing questions. And we're just scratching the surface today, but I think that we have some meaningful results to share. So everyone has seen this slide a potentially a million times or never before, depending on how many of these presentations you've watched. Um, I took this directly from Matthew Schwartz's last presentation. He was the last uh, researcher to present the AMER data. And it just highlights the different levels of monitoring that we do under the program. Um, level one is very intensive monitoring that's typically managed by the Army Corps of Engineers and it's a very very specific studies they just came out with an amazing memo um, a big report with a lot of data in it, um, it we're gonna mention it later um, in this talk um, we're gonna provide some highlights that retain that relate to our sites but I also provided a link um, and I recommend everyone read that report it's a really good one um, then we are going to primarily talk about level two and level three monitoring. Level two is looking at plant community, habitat conditions, 
prey uh, channel cross sections. We also do a fish check in um, at year five, and we're going to talk about that today. Um, and this is done pre restoration and then years one, three, five, and ten. And we've uh, we're going to start adding a year eight to check in on sites that seem to need a little bit more monitoring to see how they're doing. Um, level three is the basic level of monitoring that all projects under the program um, will receive. And this is mainly done by project sponsors. And this is looking at water surface elevation, water depth, water temperature, sediment accretion, um, photo points, and to some degree, some elevation data. This is done pre all the way through, every year through year five and then year 10. So again, today we're gonna be talking about level two and level three data for a few sites. And I just want to talk about this kind of nested uh, system that we have. Now, if you want to know a lot more about this, you can read the report. There's a full background um, information. OK, so what is the overarching question that we're trying to address with the level two and level three monitoring? Um, I think it's important to always lead with a question when you're showing results, right? So how are these restoration sites developing over time compared to a reference wetland, so like an ideal condition, um, and then also uh, relative to the goals of the project. A lot of projects have very specific goals just that are fitted to that project. And so we want to think about both of these things. How's it doing overall compared to reference sites? And then how's it doing relative to the goals that they set for themselves? Some really common goals, um, you know, plant community development, develop, uh, development of native plant communities across these sites. That's a common goal, something we'll talk about today. Um, Restoration of tidal hydrology, no longer restricted by tide gates or levees. Um, you know, reference level sediment and channel dynamics. We want to see accretion and erosion and channel and floodplain development like you would see at a reference site or an ideal site. Um, and then all of these things support the macroinvertebrate and salmonid food web dynamics that we um, are really trying to restore across the entire estuary. And so these things all feed into each other. And so I just wanted to kind of highlight that. And then some of you may be staring at this beautiful drone imagery of the Cowlitz uh, restoration site um, in Young's Bay, the Walewski site. And um, you can see that this is year three at that site. It's doing really well. OK, so in 2019, I have highlighted on the map uh, the sites that we monitored for level two. So again, looking at habitat intensive monitoring. And um, today we're going to talk about all of these sites. Um, we're not going to talk too much about Staggerwald because it's still in pre-monitoring, um, but we did survey it uh, at a level two level, level two level, with habitat data um, in 2019. And so here are the sites we're going to talk about in detail. So I'm not going to give any hot takes yet because we're going to go in detail at each of these. Um, so Wallacut, North Unit, Phase Two, and then Steamboat Slough. Now I am going to provide a little bit of a hot take for the sites we surveyed in 2020. So that was this summer. So during COVID, uh, we were able to do full site surveys. We really had to scale down our crew numbers and I really appreciate all the effort everybody went into making it extra safe. Um, we had a lot of success going out there and doing this work. Uh, we went out to Walewski. It looks amazing. Um, year three, it's really popped. A lot of native plant communities. We are going to be doing a full drone analysis of that um, for our synthesis report coming out. Um, flights in, sadly, we got there, I think, the day after they had mowed the entire site down to the ground. So we were not able to capture uh, good veg data out there, but we're hoping moving forward for year five, we can get out there before mowing starts. Looking forward to that. Um, Le Center Wetlands, um, year five out there. It looks, the shrub scrub is just really popping out there. It's getting really big. Um, We've got the low marsh zones really dense with Wapato. We do have an abundant Reekinary grass in the high marsh, but that's to be expected in this area um, of the river. And then again, we're still doing some pre-monitoring out at Staggerwald. So those are my hot takes for 2020. And now looking to the future, this summer, we get to go back out to Wallacut, which is really exciting. Um, they're doing that fish sampling this year, so the five-year check-in. Um, we're going to start monitoring West Sand Island, which is in year one. Um, and we're going to be partnering with the Army Corps to hopefully collect some drone imagery out there. I'm really excited about that. Um, we're going to do an eight-year check-in at Ruby Lake, uh, North Unit Phase 1. That check-in, we're going to really focus in on looking at those scrape-down areas and how they're developing. 
And then um, John Polinski or Burlington Bottoms is going to be in pre-monitoring. And so we're excited to get out there with Crest and um, get some pre-monitoring data. That site's going to be slated for restoration soon. And then you can see this drone imagery of Staggerwald. It's under construction and it'll be under construction all summer. All right, so moving in to what are research questions that we're gonna really address today. And so this is a drone image, thanks Narayan, um, of me in the Wapato Inlet Center. And I think that we really wanna focus today on is the question of what is the progress of native plant community restoration? Now, this is really important um, because plant community restoration in these wetlands, it speaks to a lot of major drivers. And so it, there's a lot going into developing native plant communities across these sites. And so major drivers are shifts in flooding frequency and duration. So getting back to that altered hydrology after restoration. Um, increases in salinity. Uh, Wallacut, we see that is in a very salty area of the river. We're expecting soils uh, to become exposed to more salty conditions. Um, soil conditions before restoration occurs or because of restoration. So thinking about scrape downs um, and how these things affect the soil and how these are going to affect plant community development. And then of course, existing conditions, reed canary grass and common uh, rush, are they already on the site? This can um, cause some resistance to change. Those are very resilient species. We also need to think about the available seed bank on the site. Um, and also nearby, are there a, is there a native seed source nearby that can help that site evolve? And then today, something we're going to talk a lot about um, as we go through and interpret our results is ongoing management, such as grazing and mowing and um, maybe doing some herbicide treatments and how this might be affecting the vegetation trajectories. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into Wallacut Slough. Um, here's a map. You can see um, that it's in El Waco or near El Waco, and it's very close to one of our long-term monitoring reference sites, El Waco Slough. Now, this was restored in 2016. Um, they removed barriers, they did channel enhancements, and we started our pre-monitoring back in 2014. Um, current management includes some treatment for invasive species, so herbicide treatments. Um, this is a little bit more of a focused map showing exactly where we monitored within these sites. And here's a list of all the data collection that has been going on. And um, you know this includes the level three, so that's the water surface elevation and depth data, sediment accretion, um, and then of course the level two, plant communities, elevations. And then we've added soil to our level two data collection in 2019. Um, and this is, um, I'm gonna be talking about these data and why they're important. And then in 2019, we also started doing, um, when we could, full drone uh, data collection with our regular RGB camera and our near-infrared cameras, uh, which really help us uh, with modeling vegetation community across the entire site. Um, and as we mentioned, this is going to be year five. We're going back out there this summer, and we're going to do a fish check-in. Uh, Noah's going to do a fish check-in. So this is the uh, point in the talk that I'm going to thank Narayan because he is our senior um, drone uh, pilot. Uh, Sneha and I both have commercial license uh, as well, and uh, Narayan is our mentor, and he's actually been training us, and he uh, has all the drone data that you see in this presentation was collected by Narayan, so he's awesome, and I really appreciate all of his work, so thanks, Narayan. This is the drone image of uh, Wallacut. So now I've gone ahead and put our vegetation grids over the drone image so you can see where they are. I'm going to be referring to these a lot as we go through the presentation, Wallacut Mouth and Wallacut Upper, and um, you know, just try to kind of think about where those are in this image. Wallacut Mouth is closer to the mouth of the major slough, and um, Upper is much higher up um, in the side, a little farther away from that area. Okay, so thinking when you're thinking about restoration projects and looking to compare across sites, it's really important to think about the elevation range. And so this is a histogram of the uh, vegetation plots that we collect. And you can see um, here on the, uh, excuse me, the x-axis, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it goes from zero to 2.5 meters. And then this is count here on the y, and that's the number of plots that we uh, collected. I'm gonna show this a few times 
um, throughout the presentation. So I just want to orient you with what it means. And so I'm going to show right now blue, that's the reference site, Ilwaco Slough. And then the green is Wallacut Upper, and then the orange is Wallacut Mouth. So what you can see right away is that the reference site is much lower in elevation. And this is a good time for me to say that their hydrology is the same. They mirror each other. So what this means is that Ilwaco Slough, the reference, is a much lower marsh. And Wallaca, both the mouth and the upper areas, are much more of a mid to high marsh zone. So this will be important as we um, interpret the results moving forward. Okay, so you're looking back at the map again. And now I would ask you to focus on the color of the dots. Those are where we sampled um, with the veg quadrats. And the yellow is a mix of non-native, standing dead, and bare ground, and the green is native. So you can see here that this is year five data. Um, the mouth has a lot more bare ground and standing dead than the, um, the upper. The upper is, is primarily native plant community. So this is really interesting. I'm gonna dive into these results. Okay, so now we're going to see um, some line graphs where we have relative cover here on the y-axis and then the years post-restoration on the x. I'm going to show a lot of these today, so I just want to get you oriented with what you're looking at. Now, this circle, the circles are light green. That's the reference site. And then the dark green that looks like it's a pretty linear increase, that's Wallacut Upper. And then the line that's not moving too much is the Wallacut Mouth. So we see very different things happening in the two vegetation grids. And this is a good time to talk about how the mouth um, has received a lot more management. Um, it was kind of a high traffic zone during um, construction. And so there was some on the ground movement um, and they have been treating invasives in there. So you know there might be some reasoning behind not seeing a lot of change in the mouth at year three. Um, Non-native cover really reflecting that uh, native, it's a mirror of the native cover where we see that a really big drop in non-native cover and water uh, Wallacut Upper um, and just a slight drop in Wallacut Mouth. So what do the native and non-native plant communities look like? What are they made out of? So if we're thinking about re canary grass as a non-native, you can see here that it dropped significantly at the Wallacut uh, mouth uh, down to 20% by year three. Um, and these are some photos of that area. You can see the bare ground and the standing dead and the re canary grass. And you can also see some of the invasives that they've been treating. And then clearly this was pre-COVID as we're all hanging out and having a good time. Huh. Okay, and now looking at standing dead and bare ground, um, we see a huge increase in standing dead and bare ground, um, particularly at the Wallacut mouth. And, um, you know, again, this I think this comes back to possibly, um, you know, the vegetation um, shifting because of increase in hydrology, but also potentially because of some herbicide treatments. Um, native plant community, primarily composed of Baltic rush in the mouth and Pacific silverweed, you see a huge increase in Baltic rush doing really well in that upper uh, high marsh zone. And, and this is very characteristic of high marshes in these areas. Also that Pacific silverweed, really beautiful, extremely dominant in that high marsh zone as you can see here in these photos. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the soil conditions because I think it's really important for us to um, try to understand why we see more bare ground and more standing dead in um, in the mouth. And so when I was talking to the Columbia Land Trust about it, they were thinking that it might be because of increased salinity levels and the plant communities are just still adjusting. And that very well could be true. However, when we look at the soil data, specifically this box and whisker plot on top, we see that there hasn't been um, you know, the, the salinity conditions are not as high um, as the reference site. And so I want to ask some questions about what are the, um, the salinity conditions on the site. We had not been monitoring uh, water salinity, so we're going to add that to kind of try to understand that a little bit more. Um, and so these data can be really slow to change, and that's why it can be really telling in terms of trying to figure out what's going on with the plant communities. Now the soil oxygen reduction potential, I'm going to talk about this a lot today. This is essentially a measure of how waterlogged and saturated the soil is and how for how long. Um, and so the more negative the number, the greater saturation, the longer that soil has been wet, so it's more reduced. 
And this is really interesting because it allows us a glimpse at the hydrology of these sites. Um, and so s small shifts in hydrology can result in differences in plant community. And sometimes we have a hard time capturing that just with elevation data. So um, you can see here that the reference site has a much lower soil oxygen reduction potential than the mouth and the upper. And this is, um, reflects what we see in these data as well, because we know that the reference site is a much lower marsh. And so that is expected that would have lower so soil oxygen reduction potentials. Um, I do think that the mouth gets a little bit more flooding, um, which is reflected in a slightly lower ORP. But we're gonna, I'm gonna show another graph of these data that will be really telling. So this is a scatter plot of the soil oxygen reduction potential and the elevation gradient here um, on the x-axis. And what you see here really clearly delineated is that Iwako Slough is, has much lower soil ORP than um, and is much lower in elevation than both Wallacut Mouth and Upper. The bubble size reflects the amount of reed canary grass. And so if I highlight those thresholds, we see that there's a certain elevation and a certain oxygen reduction potential that lends itself to hosting non-native plant communities like reed canary grass. And we actually see these thresholds across all of our ecosystem monitoring and restoration sites. And I think that as the site continues to progress, it'll be really interesting to keep thinking and looking at these data. Okay, so hopefully I'm not moving too quickly and everybody's tracking with me. We are now going to shift to talking about the drone analysis. Wallacut is one of the first sites that we've been able to do a full site drone analysis on, um, and we're really excited to present these data. You can see here that I have overlaid my plant classifications um, on top of the drone imagery so you can see how they line up. We have really high resolution data. Um, it's actually greater than a quarter meter in resolution, and it's very accurate when we cross check it with our ground control points for both elevation and plant community composition. So you can see how this provides a much larger picture of what's going on on the site, and we can track changes uh, much easier over time across a greater area when we can incorporate the drone imagery um, into this analysis. And so one of the other tools that this gives us is the ability to create hypotheses about future conditions. And that, and while I'm not gonna talk about sea level rise and climate change, one of the potentials for this is to think about projecting how we anticipate plant communities to change because of sea level rise and climate change. So that is definitely something we could do later. But for this, I just wanted to project five to 10 years out in the future what we expect Wallacut to look at like. Um, and so I was able to utilize this data. Uh, oh, first I wanted to highlight kind of how you can match up the drone imagery to the, um, to the model. And it's a really good match. Um, okay, so moving into my projections. Um, essentially, I'm anticipating that we should see about a 10 acre increase in native wetland matrix. Uh, between years five and 10, and about a 10 acre decrease in reed canary grass and uh, standing dead. So that's really promising, and now we can uh, utilize this as a hypothesis. Moving forward, we can cross check it with new data this summer. Okay, so wrapping that up, um, really positive trajectory um, at Wallacut for plant community. Um, um, evolution. Uh, we did see potentially some impacts of herbicide treatment in those low to mid marsh zones and I've talked to uh, the Columbia Land Trust about that and we're going to be some doing some adaptive management kind of reducing herbicide treatments um, in those areas so we can see what the natural trajectory will be um, and we're excited to go back this summer and evaluate it. Okay now I'm going to pass the mic over to Sneha so hopefully she hasn't fallen asleep because I know I talk forever. And um, she's going to talk about North Unit Phase 2. after uh, selecting Cunningham Lake, that's in the south side of uh, Saudi Island, as you can see, as the reference site, and uh, as part of restoration, uh, they removed water control structures and, uh, and some marsh plane lowering done 
uh, and the material that was removed uh, during this lowering was it was used as was used to create an artificial berm over which uh, shrub shrub plantings were uh, were done. Essentially, what this did was it uh, allowed hydrologic access to the site as well as allowed longer periods of inundation uh, to create these uh, native emergent wetlands. Currently, um, to control invasive species, there is um, some cattle grazing that keeps going on. Uh, next slide, please. So, as of 2019, uh, we went out to collect level 2 data as part of the year 5 post restoration monitoring. We have previously collected data in 2014 as well as 2017 for year 1 and year 3, uh, year 1 and year 3 post restoration monitoring. Uh, we collected a full suite of uh, metrics that is plant community data, RTK elevations of the ground hydrology data as well as sediment depletion and erosion. Uh, we included soil data as well as UAV imagery as part of the data collection uh, effort of this year. Uh, NOAA researchers that Raiden, Susan and Jeffrey wrote also went out in um, April of 2019 to conduct a fish community check-in. Thank you so much for doing that for us. And in the future, this is one of the sites that we um, anticipate having a possible eight-year check-in that's in 2022, and of course, a final 10-year check-in in 2024. Uh, we are also going to think about reducing the amount of grazing that goes on in this site. Next slide, please. So, um, first, We'd like to talk a little bit about um, the results that was reported out on by NOAA for their fish community check-in. Um, essentially, the researchers at NOAA went out for two days in April of 2019 um, to collect uh, fish, fish catch abundance data. The maps that you can see on the slide right now are uh, locations of where these, uh, this, this data was collected. Contrary to what these slides show, back in April of 2019, both these lakes were completely inundated, which um, allowed more access into into these lakes. Next slide, please. Once these data were selected and analyzed, uh, we found that uh, Chinook salmon were predominantly what was the most uh, abundant in both these lakes. We didn't find uh, evidence of any other uh, salmonic species. Uh, Mars, Mars salmon, were, Mars chinook salmon were the maximum amount of um, fish caught, and uh, they were mostly sub yearling frequency. Uh, next slide, please. Among the non salmonids, we found a total of 13 different species, uh, of which Three spine pickleback, red shiner, and seamouse were the most abundant. There were also seven species of non-native uh, fish caught in these in these areas. Next slide, please. So to summarize, basically these results are pretty much similar to what we what we have found in Ruby Lake in 2018. And uh, as a check-in abundance data, for sure, we can see that the salmonids are using these sites like they were, um, like people anticipated. However, this is just a one-time five-year check-in, which is more of an opportunistic, opportunistic um, data selection. So we would recommend moving forward having more check-ins so that we can completely see how the fish use patterns are at this site. And uh, we move into the plant community results that are going to be talked about by Dr. Sarah Kitt. Is that, is that a whale? Is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, Sneha, I dropped that whale in last minute. Catherine said we had to have a whale in the slides, so I, I thought you would want to present it. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it
mean, they did see a Draven in the Sanofia River last week, so yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah Cunningham Salute's not that far off from there. Nice addition. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Thank you, Sneha. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to jump into uh, the plant community data for um, North Unit, and I wanted to, it was a good opportunity for me to show this really pretty sunrise photo from Scapoose Bay on our way into the site. Um, all right, so here is a, um, a map of, uh, now we're going to talk, we break deep, um, excuse me, North unit up into Millionaire and Deep Widgeon, just like uh, she showed the fish data. And um, this is a aerial image of the site before restoration occurred in Millionaire South and North. And then this is an image uh, post restoration. And you can see that there was some strategic scrape down and berm creation in Millionaire North. Um, and those show up really well in the Google images. Uh, we did not do a drone analysis of this site yet, but we do plan on doing it in the future. Um, let's see. So if you're looking at this, I actually did color coat all of the quadrats uh, to show native um, and non-native dominance. And what you'll see here, um, just kind of looking at all these scattered dots, is that we do see a little bit of a shift to actually almost more non-native standing dead and bare ground um, at year five than we did pre-restoration. So that's um, and we're going to get into why that is. Um, so we, particularly in Millionaire, we saw a lot of heavy grazing. Uh, we, di we didn't actually see any cows, but we could tell that the cows had been out there. And um, you can see in this picture that, um, you know, the, the, the plant communities were really just mowed all the way down to the mud. Um, a lot of bare ground in that area. And so that's something to consider moving forward as an adaptive a management approach for this site is to maybe decrease the amount of grazing. Okay, so everyone should be familiar with these um, line graphs now. We have relative cover and then all of the years post restoration at the bottom. The reference site, which is Cunningham Lake, very close by, is gray with uh, circles. And then we see, I've highlighted here that this green line is Millionaire North, and that is where the scrape down and berm were placed um, across the sample grids. So we see that there's actually fairly low level of native species um, at Millionaire North and um, some variable uh, native cover over time in Millionaire South, but pretty good um, in 2019. Um, and then this is mirrored over here in the non-native cover. Uh, however, that scrape down in berm um, area in North is got a lot more non-natives. So this is another picture of the Millionaire North area, and um, you can see our survey crew out there um, in the scrape down area, which does appear to be at a good elevation to host abundant Wapato. Um, however, I don't know if any, if you guys can see on your screen, there is a lot of texture going on here in the mud, and those are all hoof prints. Uh, let me tell you, cows love Wapato. It is a delicious salad. So they definitely went in there and ate a lot of Wapato. Okay, now I'm going to move on to uh, Deep Widgeon. Now, Deep Widgeon, we did not see as much cattle activity. I think that it's actually a lot harder for them to get into this area. Um, this is the pre-restoration uh, layout of our um, vegetation data. And you can see here when I add the post-restoration, I don't know if it's clear for everybody, but down here you can see a big scrape down in berm creation. Um, similar data um, in terms of native and non-native uh, dominance. Uh, for 2014 and 2019. So this is uh, Deep Widgeon North. That's where the scrape down occurred. And you can see that this scrape down is not um, is, is a little different than the other. This one is a lot deeper. It's actually uh, a pond um, that's a pond all year long, I think, you know, in most water years. You can see Sneha is reaching down trying to get some soil data under the water. Um, and then it goes quite steep and becomes kind of a re-canary grass dominant bank. Um, and so if we're looking at these graphs of native and non-native cover, um, we see that both north and south deep widgeon are, are pretty low native cover relative to the reference site. And this is, um, and, and then they have a lot more non-natives relative to the reference site at year five. Okay, so I want to talk about why that is and, and provide some um, explanation for what these, uh, these trajectories that we see. 
Um, this is a box and whisker plot of the elevation um, broken down by native and non-native dominance and as well as bare ground. So there's a lot of information on this graph, but what I want you to focus in on is here the reference site. You can see that it's pretty much from about 2.3 to about three meters, um, NAVD 88 in elevation. Um, and you can see it's pretty well zoned out with three canary grass kind of being in that upper uh, portion of the uh, wetland. Now, if we compare the elevations across all of the monitoring areas for Millionaire and Deep Widgeon, um, it becomes really clear what's going on with these vegetation trajectories. Um, the berm areas are really high. They're in the shrub scrub zone and so probably um, need to have a little bit more plantings to help those shrub scrub communities um, pop a little bit in those reed canary grass patches. Um, and then those scrape downs, especially uh, Millionaire North and um, Deep Widgeon North, some of the scrape down is fairly low, lower than um, normally vegetated um, even in the reference site. So those are more like stream um, channel bottoms, um, or at least that's the habitat that it's creating. Um, and then you can also see here in Millionaire South, something really weird is going on because there's all this bare ground right where there should be dominance of native plant communities. And that's just from the heavy grazing. So I think that, um, you know, back in 2014, when this project started, you know, we didn't have such easy access to really high accuracy elevation data, um, RTKs. We take those with us everywhere, both Crest and uh, us at, at the LSEP have our own RTK units. We cross check them in the field. Um, and so we now have a lot of really good data to help us move forward with adaptive management and new projects. Um, and, I, and I'm really hoping that this information is helpful. So I also want to talk about, oh yeah. Not great. Um, millionaire absolutely is. That's why you're seeing the cattle on that side. Uh, but I think another thing that is not called out in this analysis, but that has happened on specifically on the deep widgeon side is a series of beaver dams have been established between where the water control structure used to be and the scrape down areas. And so where you're seeing these ponded areas, it's not necessarily that they're that much lower. The design elevations are similar for Ruby, Millionaire, Deep Widgeon. It's that these beaver dams are actually holding water year round where those other sites aren't. And so that's just kind of been an interesting takeaway where, again, the design elevations were roughly in the same range as other sites that saw better vegetation response. But in this case, the beaver dams are actually ponding water year round, keeping it as uh, mud flat and uh, not allowing a lot of that emergence to come in. There is obviously a little bit of variation with those elevations where it's a little bit lower at deep widgeon, but in general, that's something that I've noticed about the hydrology out there that, that seems to really be impacting the vegetation. That's really helpful. And um, I think that doing a full a drone analysis of like the entire area will be really helpful. Um, so I really appreciate you interrupting and talking about those details. Um, I know that uh, one other thing I want to point out here is that these thresholds that I've highlighted on the graph, you know, they can shift due to changes in freshet conditions. We have found that re canary grass abundance can actually shift up to 20% across the site just based on the freshet conditions for that year. So, um, you know, these, these levels can shift and it can be tricky to get right in the right zone um, with these. Uh, so it's, it's a, one of those things, that, that's why we like to do multiple years of monitoring and, be, and consider all of these variables. Okay, so thinking about, yeah, I really appreciate that. And I think that what you just said uh, might also help us interpret, uh, you know, we can utilize this soil oxygen reduction potential data to interpret some of those results as well. And so that's really getting at that hydrology that you're talking about. Um, and so here I've got the reference um, elevation and then the soil ORP on the bottom. And then I've, uh, all the dots are based on dominant plant communities. I'm gonna add uh, north unit phase two. And you can see here that these sites are, are really mirroring each other in terms of soil conditions. 
um and these elevation thresholds that we see for the reed canary grass. so i think this is really helpful. it it kind of um unsolving like ah unraveling the mystery, if you will, of plant community trajectories. so we plan on continuing to monitor soil oxygen reduction potential across sites to help us with that. so i think that we saw that salmon utilized the site. um it's a very productive site. um it has a really good native plant community development um which is a little bit dependent on elevation ranges and grazing intensity. Uh, future adaptive management, um, thinking about f adding more fencing to keep out the heavy grazing and then potentially um, adding in some more shrub scrub uh, plantings. Uh, clearly that's a really challenging thing in the canary grass, but figured I'd throw it up there. Um, and then in 2022, we look forward to going back to the site at eight years and doing a full uh, drone analysis and site survey. Okay, so I'm going to hand it back to Sneha, and we're going to talk about Steamboat Slough um, and the results that we saw there. Thank you, sir. Um, Steamboat Slough is another site that was, uh, that we went back to in 2019 for uh, year five level two data collection. Uh, this site is located in the tidal reach uh, on Julia Hansen uh, Refuge in Gatlamit, Washington. It was restored in 2014 after Welch Island reference was the reference site. Um, the restoration activities included uh, removing uh, levees and uh, a little bit of marsh plain uh, lowering so that as and uh, creating a network of channels so that there was um, hydrologic access to the site and more uh, areas that we could uh, convert into a native emergent wetland. As of right now, there isn't a lot of uh, management activities being done to um, is to keep the invasives at the next slide. This site was um, so back in 2019. We again collected the similar suite of uh, metrics as uh, low and uh, not unit phase two. The only thing we didn't collect here was the UAV aerial imagery um, because uh, we were under uh, federal restrictions. This site also has more information as it is a part of a very intensive uh, monitoring study that was con uh, conducted by PNNL and uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service with um, Army Corps funding which studied basically the issues as well as nutrient dy dynamic fluxes at the site. Um, and we will be presenting certain results of those reports, predominantly the PITAG array results that were collected and analyzed uh, by Reagan, Susan, and uh, Jeffrey Grove. Thank you again. So um, we're going to be using this to talk about the fish access at the site. Um, essentially, back in 2018, NOAA installed Pythagoras at Welch Island and Steamboat Slough. Uh, these were operational between mid-April to end of August of 2017. Additionally, the Pythagoras at uh, Steamboat Slough was operational for another two years. Uh, so that we could have more information about the fish use at the site. Um, as of 2017, uh, yearling salmon were detected at both these sites, and um, of these detections, false salmon, Chinook uh, were the majority, and followed closely by steelhead and uh, coho. The residence time between these, between these stocks greatly varied. Um, Paul Chinook used the used team with Flu and Welsh Islands for uh, a matter of days, whereas um, Steelhead and Coho were just either a few minutes and maximum of a day. Uh, continued monitoring at Steamboat in uh, between 2018 and 2019 confirmed these facts uh, while they had some interannual variation. Uh, so, well, NOAA also observed. Um, 
a few spring chinook and summer steelhead are just using uh, steamboat flu over the year of over the years of monitoring. However, their residence times were um, just a, a matter of a few minutes. Uh, to summarize these, well, obviously, definitely, please go take a look at uh, their um, level one monitoring report as well as this chapter and the remaining chapters give a beautiful um, roundup of the nutrient dynamics as well as the uh, fish access at the site. Um, but all in all, Steamboat Flu is definitely a very productive um, ecosystem for uh, salmon. someone else was going to add some more information, but um, yeah, that's about it, and I'd like to pass the mic back to Sarah to continue with the plant community results. Thanks, Neha. Sorry, I'm trying to toggle my audio here. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, Okay, so I know everybody's getting pretty tired. Um, we are really close to being done. Just a few more minutes. We're going to go through the Steamboat SLU plant community results, and then it'll be time for questions and group discussion. Um, so this is a picture of Narayan. He's in the middle of one of the channels that were developed um, in Steamboat SLU. Um, and you can see that this is a very robust wetland plant community uh, surrounding him. Um, you know, after uh, channel construction, this was essentially all bare ground. So this is really developed uh, amazingly in five years. So to take a look at that in an aerial image, we can see this map. Um, has Steamboat West and Steamboat East. These are our two uh, monitor monitoring grids. Um, as with the other maps, I've color-coded uh, native and non-native dominance. And I'm gonna pop up the post-restoration image. This was uh, after channel construction had taken place, and then I've placed the 2019 vegetation community data on top of that. Um, you can see that Steamboat West was heavily impacted by um, channel development um, and restoration activities, and that, and it also ended up being uh, a really huge flip from non-native to native emergent wetland plant communities. Uh, Steamboat East was a pre-existing pond, so it's actually a fairly low elevation um, overall, um, and you can see that it's remained a little bit similar, but has changed, and we'll talk more about those details. So I'm, I wanted to pull up the elevation histogram again so that we could think about the data that we're looking at and where it falls along the elevation and hydrology uh, spectrum. I do want to mention that we are not showing uh, hydrographs. They are all in the report. And for all the sites that we're talking about today, um, the hydrographs now mirror the reference sites completely. So we, we, we don't see, uh, we see really good hydrology uh, reintroduction to all of these sites. Um, so. This uh, hydrology mirrors the reference site, which is Welch Island, it's fairly close by. Welch Island, however, in blue, is much higher in elevation than Steamboat East and Steamboat West. Steamboat East is more of a very low marsh, while Steamboat West is kind of a mid, -mar mid to high marsh zone. So that's a really important thing to think about as we move forward in the data. So these graphs should look similar. Um, we can see that Steamboat West um, here had a huge increase um, up to over 70% native cover um, by year five, really dramatic. And then we also see a, a fairly dramatic increase um, at Steamboat East as well um, by year five at 50% cover. Uh, this is mirrored by a drop in non-native plant cover, uh, really promising, really good results at this site uh, for shifts in plant community. Now thinking of bare, about bare ground, a lot of the site, um, there was um, you know, a lot of bare ground at year one. Um, and how has that changed over time? Well, we see a really big drop in bare ground at Steamboat West. Steamboat East is a little bit more of a moderate drop, but pretty low um, coming in at you know, just right between 10 and 15% cover. If you look at the photos, it kind of is explaining what you see. Steamboat East, um, some you know our veg transects actually cross this channel, so we're getting channel bottom, um, and we are still getting a lot of natives or native aquatics. Then Steamboat West, being the mid to high marsh zone, very very dense mid to high marsh plant community going on there. So looking at reed canary grass, um, we initially saw a little bit of an increase um, at Steamboat East, but now that has dropped down, um, and Steamboat West is uh, very low for reed canary grass cover. Um, you can see that it does grow in a matrix, reed canary grass kind of out competing with all the others, but it's not winning the fight. 
Um, Wapato is really gaining ground out there. We see it growing um, in with the re-canary grass, which is a sign that the hydrology is working really well, and it's that mid-marsh zone where um, these natives can outcompete compete re-canary grass. And um, one thing that I really wanted to mention is this not, nodding beggar's tick, which we do get at pretty high proportions across our monitoring grids. But if you go out to the site and you're just looking out there during peak biomass, there are just acres and acres of nodding beggar's, uh, beggar's tick. And it's, it, it would be really beautiful to be able to pull that up in a full drone analysis, um, aerial image modeling of the plant communities. And so we're really, really hoping that we either A, can afford to buy an American-made drone and do the flights under the current federal regulations, or better yet, the federal regulations are dropped and we can use our DGI drone out there. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to that. Okay, so I'm gonna show this uh, soil map again with soil ORP and elevations. Um, that's been really informative moving forward. We can also use it to predict changes in plant community as time goes on. Um, we have this two meter line here and the ORP about 150 at this site. We can see that in the reference site is fairly clearly zoned. Here in the Steamboat Slough, we don't really have a lot of high marsh plots to fill this in. Um, and those plots that we see that are kind of a mix of native and non-native right along the two meter line, um, I do believe those will probably flip to dominant non-native um, in, in a few more years as the um, soils continue to evolve and the plant communities continue to kind of battle it out. So that's really interesting. All right, wrapping up this last uh, presentation of Steamboat Slough, uh, really robust wetland soil and plant community development across the site, mirroring what we see at the reference site. Um, I'm not presenting these results today, but in the past we have uh, published some biomass results. By year three, the site had a reference level biomass accumulation, which was really telling that also thinking about the flux study and detritus export matching the reference wetland. Um, and then uh, PNNL, Sneha did a great job um, summarizing the PNNL and NMS, uh, NMFS study. Um, I definitely recommend looking at that. There was a link earlier in the presentation. And then again, we're going to be doing that 10-year check-in. I'm really looking forward to seeing what the site looks like at year 10 and then doing that drone analysis. Okay, last slide. Um, ne next steps. We um, would like to uh, consistently incorporate both soil conditions monitoring and uh, UAV or drone monitoring across all level two sites. We strongly encourage uh, UAV or drone uh, photo monitoring at all sites, levels one through three in monitoring. Um, oblique uh, images from sites can be very, very telling, and I honestly can do a lot of plant ID just by looking at photos. Um, increases um, in the number and distribution of sediment benches and pens, we found that that data can be a little bit unreliable because it's so variable, so we want to really increase the number of those. Um, across sites. And then monitoring uh, salinity at Wallacut, that's kind of a, a weird thing to add here, but that's a next step for us. We wanted to start monitoring that to see what was going on. Um, and then I know that uh, Sienna had mentioned the protocol update, and that is, um, we're going to be coming out with those protocols in the fall. Uh, we have a lot of protocol updates that we have made. Um, those are all on our website, and so you can you can go and see how, how they're progressing, but the final update won't be until fall 2021. Sorry, my puppy is crying. Um, Okay, so a reduce, uh, oh, restoration and adaptive management suggestions. Uh, we've discussed uh, kind of cutting back some of the herbicide treatments at Wallacut, depending on where it's at in the wetland. They, CLT has agreed to that. And then I'm not sure how we can move forward with the idea of reducing grazing at North Unit Phase 2, but something that I think we should consider. Um, sorry, I'm talking fast and furious. We're coming right at, in at 53 minutes. I appreciate everyone so much for sitting through the presentations and um, please, now is the time for questions. Sneha and I are happy to answer them. I just want to put a qualifier out there first that um, that lower Wallachet mouse area is also where we flattened the levee and filled the ditch. Um, so I, I'm really interested in the soil condition uh, because I think we are um, challenged in some of these scraped down areas for native vegetation reestablishment at that elevation. Um, so it'd be really great to learn more about that. Um, and that area was also, and that site is chronically infested with gorse. Uh, 
and that area in particular was coarse. And so, yeah, that, so uh, I just want to put it out there that we're not just liberally using a lot of herbicides in that area. We have a really chronic issue that we will lose any kind of native community there if we don't control the course. And Austin can probably talk to that more, but just put that out there. Yeah, and I hope I did not try, I tried not to oversell the herbicide use. We were just trying to find different explanations for what we saw in the plant community um, shifts. And at year three is really early still. So, you know, we, we might go back out there this summer and, you know, it, it might have started rebounding. So I really appreciate that um, information for the group. Yeah, and the, the, I'm interested in the salinity as well because of the reed canary grass. Because it's, I don't know that we have great data, but it seems like the native uh, reed canary grass is increasing, which is counterintuitive to any kind of salinity being present in the wall Um So I, I'm really appreciative that you guys are looking at that as well, or will be. Any more questions? Um, there's something else trying to, yeah. I'm having a hard time pulling up the chat. So if anybody, I'm sorry. I don't, I'm sorry, there, I don't think there's any questions on the chat. Maybe it's just such a thorough job that there's no questions. <laughs> <laughs> what do you Sneha was going to lead it. Sneha? Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks, Catherine and Sarah, for opening this up to the group. Now, since what we want to discuss with um, everyone on the call is um, we've been able to see all of these great changes in the restored wetlands. However, there may be or there are certain points where we are seeing different types of endpoints or there are some issues at these sites that need to be addressed or is there a way moving forward where we can um, pinpoint these thresholds or uh, what better data can we incorporate and how do we use these data in an adaptive management framework and what exactly is the point where we say okay this site is completely restored and whether we are going to go back and see how these how these sites are progressing further than the like after the ten year mark. Um, any any ideas, anyone? So you just for clarification, you're saying like how do we know whether we're successful or not? What how at what point do we know that, yeah, the project has been successful, it's met our design standards that we designed this project for, and when can we so-called release it and not have to go back and continue to monitor it? You know, are there like some kind of quantifiable thresholds that we want to use as benchmarks for that? Is that just a, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's that question. Um, or... Anyone on the science work group got uh, any, any, um, any strong feelings about this? Hello? 
Hey, Catherine, this is Jason. This is Jason Carnezos over at Bonneville Power. The, the first thing that pops into my mind is uh, what do we know as a region about the natural variability of reference sites? If reference sites are what we're calling kind of optimal or at uh, least better than, you know, just more disturbed sites. And so somehow getting a sense of, you know, what comes to mind is tying together, you know, the EMP work that you do also in the estuary. At some point, is, is there just there's just a level of natural variability across the things that we measure or should be measuring? And, and, and if, um, I'm thinking of a graph you guys showed me years ago about good reasons for studying status and trends of sites. Now, you know, it's just it's the response to restoration sites is well, <clears throat> kind of tracking the conditions that reference sites are meeting up in or or in frequent basis. Uh, so that's a mouthful, but I was thinking about natural variability and I think ideally if we can monitor and capture that range of variability, you know, maybe across the wetland zone or however you want to chop up the estuary, that might be a place to start. Hey, this is Rudy. I was thinking about many of the proposals and projects as they were installed may have explicitly or incidentally described the goals that they were trying to achieve in the project itself. And it might be useful to understand if those explicit goals were met, what that timeline is and where it fits in with an expected trajectory. I think, I think that would be interesting and also to maybe spell it out in the project proposal uh, timelines and factors that might real, roll into it. I think those are plenty of opportunities for learning out of that little set of questions. This is Ryan Lozmer with SAT. Um, I agree with Jason. We should, uh, in order to choose these reference sites, especially with AMR 1 and AMR 2. Um, so once you reach your monitoring benchmarks on the reference sites and we mirror the site in question, what it isn't at what we're trying to attain are the levels of the reference sites, if it is a good reference site. Um, and yeah, after year 10, that's when they can be released. And if they don't attain those, those metrics, um, you know, ideals, then I guess you look, look into adaptive management or lessons learned or something along those lines. Thanks. This is Laura Brown. Um, I'm just interested in thinking about how, you know, like if we're meeting reference goals um, and what to do if the reference sites are declining or decreasing and how to kind of account for that component. Yeah, I want to chime in and say that um, I, th I, I, I really agree with Rudy um, in terms of, you know, in these project designs and uh, the project planning process, creating goals and objectives with measurable outcomes that, you know, someone like me or anyone can go in and monitor to kind of reflect on. I think that would be really helpful because I know that a lot of projects have, of course, those general goals that I put forward earlier, but also very specific goals to the project. And that's something that we're really working on with Staggerwald, and it's really a process. Um, but I do agree. Um, I think that um, Jason had mentioned at one point that you know he thought that would be a good idea in terms of thinking about the monitoring even before the site has goes into the construction. Um, I think it's really important. Um, and then for um, just thinking about what is a reference condition and how, you know, 
I think it's good to say, yes, we want it to reach those reference levels. Well, I, I tried to show today that sometimes even a good reference site in terms of like if it's nearby, it has similar hydrology, can be challenging as a matchup because it might represent different elevations or, or slightly different hydrology. And so we need to think about giving ourselves some grace um, and figuring out what the right answers are. And um, I do think that doing like a full drone analysis of, a, of the, an entire site might be a more informative than just the veg um, grids. I mean, that would be incorporating the veg grid data, but I'm, I'm just interested in hearing more. Uh, but I just wanted to inject that. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. This is the end. Sarah, I, 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 oh. No, go ahead. Oh, oh I just, this is Reagan. I just had a quick comment. Um, I'm not as familiar with um, restoration literature, but I'm just wondering if there is something in that body of work that lends itself to um, the guidelines you know, uh, as to judging, you know, efficacy of, of restoration projects and, and if you guys have, have looked toward for the literature uh, for that answer. Ian or Tom or somebody in the restoration practitioner, have you guys have you do have you guys looked into that? Do you have any guidance? Yeah. yeah, this is Ian. I'm taking through my oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, just pondering the, the question. Well, this, this is Jason again. Just to uh, emphasize, I wanted to acknowledge Rudy and Sarah's comments about you know, specific goals to the specific site. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not an either. <clears throat> it's a, one, one scale is, just, I think, maybe more in the, the light that the PA had cast with the question of how do we know when we're done. <clears throat> and then Catherine following up with how do we define success. Uh, yeah, clearly, um, we'll be, we'll be, you know, we always, the verdict reviews are looking at the specific goals of the project. I'm assuming, um, although I looked at the process, the process, the PRC review, we should be incorporating those questions early on, specific to the question, which should, you know, tie back to the goal of the Appreciate the conversation. Not an easy answer with the, with the dynamic landscape. Yeah. I, I agree, <laughs> and, and I think I think this is Rudy again. So if you pop back to the goals and objectives, I mean those are things that the ERTEG and the science work group and everybody looks at to understand certainty of success. And I know you couple that with the concept of how long. How long do you need to have to have the lift that you're looking for in some of the SERP objectives? So if you were able to tie some of these predictions and outcomes to certain time lengths, you might begin to wrap your mind, your collective funding minds around how long will it take to achieve a lift and what are you willing to pay for? Do you get what I'm saying? How long out? Well, yeah. For example, how long will protection buy you something? So not even doing anything else, because you know if we're looking at limited budgets and you know desired goals, then there are different ways of achieving those things. And so I think it'd be useful to understand the time involved and what's delaying some actions from taking full fruit, that sort of thing. Yeah, and to kind of add on to that, Rudy and Jason is the. Uh, I feel like the, I've looked at enough ERDIC templates and PRC templates to know that people put in more goal statements, like increase uh, hydrology or, or improve hydrology or increase um, inundation, but they're not objective. They're not quantifiable and there's no time period to it. So what, like Sarah 
and that back in the day when they did that synthesis analysis of back um, with the SM2, whatever, um, remember, or that was a few years ago. But they, it, they basically had to come up with their own definition of occupancy or of um, capacity or whatever it was. And it was basically they decided, okay, this is the level of inundation, this is the time period of the inundation, and this is the frequency of the inundation, and this is also the water temperature. So they created this, just the two of them, versus having the project sponsor define what they mean by fixed best sort of thing. So that's more of a smart objective, if you will, and that needs to be what I think we're all saying is, how do we, as the monitoring folks, measure whether a project is successful or not if project sponsors aren't defining what their measure of success is going to be from the get-go, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think it, it does make sense at the end. Sorry, uh, I must be on a delay because I keep interrupting people. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, so to Regan's previous question around the research, I guess uh, my mind. So I'm agreeing. I, I, I really like the, the comments and thoughts that are being shared here around uh, objectives, and, and um, my mind actually, uh, besides thinking about the restoration question or research question, was. Um, thinking about the objectives and the provincial review and thinking how we better define what success looks like and, and breaking that down. So I, I think that, that part of this conversation is really helpful for me. Um, I also think that some of the monitoring like the veg grids are too specific. They don't capture the big picture. Um, and I, I really like the idea of drone and classification and, and, and at least having maybe both data sets is something that also looks at the, the broader vegetation because it's really easy to look at some of that I'm thinking candle right now uh, where it's like oh it's all free canary grass when I know it's not um, having been out on the site and seeing what's happening uh, it, anyway so I, I, so I just want to say yes uh, on the bigger picture and if your own technology is a way to get to that classification um, that would be awesome Yeah, thanks for that. And we completely agree. Like, even in when we have gone out to several sites, like, for example, in Steamboat Slough, uh, we have noticed, like, the nodding pericotics of what the uh, highlighted in the presentation today, but that's not covered in our vegetation grid. So, that's something that the UAV technology can definitely pick up. And uh, we could, this is something that we should readily incorporate into our um, aimer monitoring as well. Yeah, and I do want to speak to the, um, Regan, to your question about incorporating literature. I think that, um, you know, we, we do the best that we can, and I think that, you know, everybody's out there looking at the literature, trying to figure out how they can incorporate it into their designs. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, to be fair, it's there's not a lot of really good restoration literature out there, and so I think that that's something else that Sneha and I, and, and we, we hope that our research partners and project sponsors will all be thinking about publishing data, publishing results helping build that community of information so that we can continue to do, you know, better projects and better adaptive management. Yeah, thanks for that. That was kind of my question is to, you know, whether whether there are some frameworks that are out there or whether this is something that, you know, perhaps we need to start developing for the region. Yeah, and I mean, I'm happy to send you my dissertation. I'll just, I'll just put in the flag that annually, um, the action agency and everybody, a lot of folks on this call review <clears throat> the SERP restoration and monitoring plan. And one of the foundational pieces to it annually is something uh, Gary Johnson designed called the Master Matrix of Learning, where we um, evaluate um, recent publications within the past year, conferences, uh, project actions, of course, lessons when we solicit information from all the sponsors on this call and more about lessons learned and projects, and, and we, we 
try to make sure that it's available for review before we publish it. So Reagan be happy to send that um, information out to you. It's available. The most recent one is 2020. We're currently in the process of working on the 2021 one, but you know that may be a for others also on the call. If you're not familiar with it, uh, it's on the estuary page of Phoebe Fish. If you're not familiar with that site, just follow up with anyone here, BPA, uh, or, or a lot of folks know it. It is it is one of those frameworks, though. It is part of the, the framework in which we, we conduct adaptive management, where ultimately the, the matrix is, is asking the question, do we make a change, uh, does it not apply, or does it reinforce what we already know? At the end of the day, it kind of comes down to those those questions, uh, and, and we don't make that call just as a, a funding agency or a regulatory agency in terms of knowledge and what we're looking for the entire region on that stuff. And I think uh, Sienna's on this call. You know, there, there's a schedule for this spring, early, maybe as early as by the end of this month or into April, where, where you'll see a draft of that. People will have the ability to put input onto not just the matrix, but the whole restoration of the plan. Hey, Jason. Um, I am on the call. Yep, that's correct. I think we've uh, gotten a little behind, <laughs> which manages to happen every year, but this year due to some some different constraints uh, around COVID and whatnot. So um, I'm hoping to send something out to yeah, the region, all the regions. So um, our, our um, stakeholders um, to a draft, hopefully by the end of this month. It was originally going to be, I believe, like last week, but yeah, we had some setbacks. So that, uh, you know, that's something that's here, hopefully they're on your radar. The one other thing we discussed, and I think Laura and I were just discussing this Friday, was, um, and this is kind of a sensitive thing that I'm not, I'm not sure how to make this work effectively, is um, having, so the Project Review Committee, and I know they're earning as well, has been interested in going to visit some of these sites after X amount of years of, of you know, post-restoration, basically. And then the question is, like, how do we learn from these different sites um, and what was effective, what was not effective? I think the one thing that, you know, we might struggle with a little bit is, like, talking with the ERDIG or the PRC as restoration practitioners and being forthright and open about what was not effective. <laughs> that doesn't usually happen all that much. But, um, and, um, but I, I think it is important that we all start to learn from each other. Like, how, you know, like some of the breakdowns um, is that process of trying to treat reed canary grass. Um, is that effective? I mean, I think what right now, uh, marsh lowering or whatever, is something that's scored high by the verdict as something that would be effective in treating reed canary grass. And I think at one point they've said that's pretty much the only thing that's going to be terribly effective. At treating reed canary grass, but um, maybe some of the monitoring is showing that that actually kind of shifts the ecosystem to something else. So, and I'm not saying that is correct or not, but I'm just saying that that could be a result of some of the monitoring five, six, seven years in. How do we get the ERDIG to con uh, to learn from that? I guess basically, or is there a venue for that? And I'm not sure the CERT document. It gets back to um, the ERDA again, where is, a, is a, an effective way to, to have a conversation with the ERDA. So it's just something to think about is like, how do we improve this adaptive management framework where we can have conversations where um, um, there's more effective learning, if you will, and there's um, integration of these the monitoring data into um, the next phases of restoration design.
I, I, I'm, I'm conscious of taking up a lot of airspace facing against the Bonneville. <clears throat> I'll just reinforce what I think I've heard from Rudy members in the past, where they welcome all sorts of information and, you know, fail, failures in one one project or, or something that was suboptimal is, is only is, is, is the greatest utility is, is learning from. Um, <clears throat> so what we knew, you know, and I'll also just remind folks that this is a relatively young program. We're writing a paper right now about, about 20 years in <clears throat> um, to, to, to on the ground restoration in a focused way, you know, getting more focused. Um, but that doesn't mean by any means we know everything. We certainly don't. Um, we don't want to feel like the dialogue can't be open and direct. And certainly, we've had plenty of conversations about, you know, fan bill versus as bill. Uh, I think there shouldn't, it shouldn't be a difficult thing if the goal is to still learn more about what we're working about uh, in the estuary. Uh, certainly, Bonneville knows the risk to habitat restoration and that what, what works in one site doesn't work in every site. Uh, I think, you know, the, the spirit of the SERP program was reinforced by NOAA. Uh, adopting it as kind of the program that, that works in the estuary is a, is one in which, you know, adaptive management is trying to learn how. And, and, and as much as possible, you know, start modeling the future. Um, you can't do that <clears throat> without learning some tough lessons. That there's no, I don't get a sense of you know punitive uh, recourse by by Bonneville or or, uh, or the early the things that, that didn't always go the way we wanted. So I, I I think you're right, Catherine. I think you know Erdig does have the the surf document available to them every year. Uh, we do do the annual meeting every year. Uh, if we need to. Uh, Combine PRC and Erdig site revisits. Uh, we can test that this fall. Uh, we have set up site evaluation cards for, for action agency funded projects. So there is that framework as well to start identifying response, biological response, uh, process response. We, I think we're, we have information. We, we're always trying to. You know, what we're, we were, we've identified as actually is, is we're always trying to increase that transparency and those those uh, corridors of communication that uh, very old ideas. This is Deanna. Um, also, just to kind of add on to what Jason was saying, um, you know, we haven't utilized the first sponsored workshop since the first year, um, <laughs> and so uh, we intended to do one this year, but I think we kind of backed off just uh, honestly to give people a, a break from, you know, long meeting, staring at the computer to relieve some meeting fatigue. And um, so, you know, that's always a vehicle as well that um, we can help set up and facilitate and um, discuss the need for and topics and, and things like that where we can just get together annually um, even if it's just to kind of organize ourselves um, prior to, you know, some communications with Ertig or whatever needs to happen there. So that's always another vehicle. Yeah, yeah and I, I should say the conversation I had with Laura was um, earlier last week was it wasn't just the PRC or Ertig. We were talking about like OEB or LCFRB, anybody that funds Funds a project. I think project sponsors have a tendency of, of um, highlighting the effectiveness um, versus like what didn't work um, when we are out on site visits. But maybe we could, because the, you know, for instance, the Erdig isn't going to go back and rescore a project that's already been funded and built. So maybe we could go back. And I and I don't know. Um, I, I'm hoping that maybe Tom or Ian or um, somebody would weigh in on the ability to discuss, you know, like, hey, are, I'm just picking on scrape downs right now and I'm not 
intending to really, I'm just picking something about like, hey, maybe a scrape down did change the way this site functioned and it's um, now bare ground instead of um, native plant mix or whatever. Um, can we discuss that? And, and is there a, a way of trying to learn from this? And maybe maybe we scraped it down a little too low or something like that. And maybe this elevation, you know, maybe we could go back and fix it or whatever. I don't know. Something where we have that kind of lesson, you know, learned. And we go visit different sites. And what worked and what really did not work or what was a challenge for these sites and then what, how we're going to go back and fix things or whatever. Um, it would be really, really good to have that kind of a conversation. As you said, Jason, it is a really early program. We're still learning a lot. So um, being able to have these kind of conversations would be really good. Okay, this is pretty. So I hear five really great conversations that probably need to be had. So I, I kind of wanted to bust into a couple of them. Um, I won't speak for the Fish Recovery Board, but the process between the sponsor um, says they're going to do and the final implementation of is a contractual relationship between the state RCO and the sponsor. So the Fish Recovery Board, who has a TAC that gauges these projects, is kind of removed from that final step. I think similarly in the estuary, project sponsors bring goals to the ERTEG, which is essentially a scoring body, and then they enter a contractual relationship with Bonneville. So then the SBUs have kind of already been submitted, and there's that step. So what did the sponsor promise they were going to do, and then what was the attendant result? I think that's a contractual pathway and it's probably something that should be explicit in the project application. I mean, the AirTag, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself now, the AirTag is scoring what the sponsor promised they were going to do and the goals that they envisioned and how likely the methods and the sites and all of that is going to pan out. So there are specific metrics that are already included in there. And because of what we talked about earlier with reference sites changing over time and the degradation of both restoration sites and reference sites coupled to the inability to look system-wide because it's so fast at direct impacts on fish populations we're making huge assumptions so if we accept that and come back to what the specific goals of a project are which is what the Arctic scores which is how Bonneville gets credit I mean, everything's wrapped up right in that. Does that make sense? Or am I just oversimplifying? Kill the room again. Really sorry about that. <laughs> I mean, Rudy, um, what you're describing sounds sounds about right to me. I, I'm not one of the people who gets project scored, but as someone who was heavily involved in the SM2 analysis, so that was that synthesis, synthesis memo that Catherine was talking about, where we did kind of a thorough review of all the uh, habitat data, restoration data collected, um, you know, the, the only thing that we really had there solid as a goal was just the site hitting the two-year flood um, elevation, which was interesting, it was an interesting metric to um, to evaluate the success of a site. So I think that there's um, potential to develop that further out. That's, that's all I'm saying. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad. I mean, just these projects were just scored on some assumptions. And let's just see if those assumptions were carried through. I mean, I think that meets most people's needs, including learning from these things because of what if something is promised? Well, why didn't it work out? Did it just take longer? Did something else need to be done? I mean, I, I feel like people are generally honest about whether their projects work and what went wrong. So, I'm just I think the one, one thing. Done it. Yeah. I think most people can report think, honestly whether their projects work or not. Yeah, I think the only thing, Rudy, uh, that I'm not really disagreeing with you. I think. Um, I think the one thing is, and that they're kind of alluded to, is the only thing that they really say is that they're going to hit the two-year flood, right? Because that's the footprint of what the project is scored on, is that two-year flood. They don't necessarily say how often they're going to meet it. They don't say, like, at what depth that's going to be. 
Um, and they don't say, like, you know, the water temperature, where we're going to get the water temperature to, you know, we're going to reduce it by X amount of degrees or whatever. And, and then they don't say, like, what X percentage of native species are going to survive or, you know, what the composition is going to look like. It's, it's really just we're going to plant 30 acres and um, treat 15 acres and um, hopefully it'll survive sort of thing. I mean, it's kind of, it's like you've, it's like more like goal statements instead of objectives where you can measure against. And I think that's what what the monitoring folks are struggling with is, okay, these are like, how do we, what are the thresholds as to where this project is successful or not? And we're making that, I mean, they're making that up um, as they go to say like, okay, this is this is the measure of success we're using. Is this okay sort of thing? And it's, I think what we're all saying is that maybe it should be part of the um, early, the template is to like, okay, we need to have more smart objectives, more quantifiable objectives that we're going to measure against to say like whether we're successful or not with this project. I think we're all saying yeah, the same that's thing. Exactly what I said. That is exactly what I said. Either we need to ask for more information or we need to just rely on the information given. What you just said. Okay. Um, this is Amy. Um, I just have um, a couple comments. Um, I think I think this is a really good conversation, and I think that the idea behind adoptive management is that you learn from the monitoring to inform future actions, and and I think that's where we all want to be headed. Is that we're learning from this monitoring that's been going on and these great results that are starting to come out from these um, sites that have been restored over a longer period of time. And we just need to really um, work towards making sure that those monitoring results are meaningful and that uh, they are um, informing future actions in both restoration and potentially actions to um, at existing restoration sites to correct things that may not be quite right. Um, I, just a couple other things. I, I think it's really important that the um, monitoring at the restoration sites be compared to appropriate reference sites um, in terms of obviously hydrology, but that elevation is super critical too. And um, I just say that in, in some cases it seems like maybe those comparisons aren't quite on the mark. Um, just few thoughts, but I, I really hope that um, these results can be used in these informative ways. Um, to, to use the ex example that Catherine was talking about on scrape down, um, you know, that is an effective method for reducing weed carry grass, but we also do um, see that it results in a different community, probably one that's maybe less productive, um, a low marsh community, and that, that's been acknowledged. Um, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad, but maybe it shouldn't be the only tool in the toolbox for trying to control reed canary grass. Hey, thanks, Amy. I, did, I really I appreciate you kind of pointing out that elevation mis mismatch um, and, and thinking about monitoring uh, in the future. It's something that we struggled with uh, when, when going through these data, and that's why I showed the, that data. Um, in terms of I want to make one last plug for the AMER report that Sneha and I published this summer because we actually provide in the executive summary a really thorough uh, look through in terms of both our monitoring suggestions for moving forward and um, some design and um, quantifiable objective uh, suggestions for restoration projects. And so we weren't able to cover that all in this presentation, but if you just read the executive summary to the report, I think it might be really illuminating. So anyway, thank you again, Amy, for those comments. Hey, this is Sienna. Um, Sarah, uh, the, those are all also um, highlighted in that SERP restoration and monitoring plan and the master matrix for learning that you're all going to see. Um, and as Jason was explaining, there's um, a piece of that that's kind of how, how do we take learning and, and implement it into our SERP program. So that's going to be considered for sure, and those are great recommendations. I appreciate you guys spending so much time on that. 
Hey, hey Sarah, um, can you, somebody was asking about the link to the document. I think you had it on like one of the first few slides. Um, is it possible to put that in the chat and or I can send it out to the science work group um, for folks? Yeah, maybe we could do both. I can put it in the chat right now. I just stopped sharing my screen so I can do that. Yes, thanks everyone for such a great conversation. The last comment that, that was in my mind for a very long time but I didn't want to interrupt this conversation was whether in all of these conversations and all of these thresholds where are we thinking of um, incorporating changes that we have been seeing through climate change and how that thing we have we have studies coming out and establishing that the lower Columbia River, different parts of the river will definitely be affected through different types of through different types of effects and how those thresholds and how these endpoints might vary and what we should be thinking about when we are going to move forward with restoration and like changing our monitoring plans or altering them to figure this part out. Awesome. Thanks. Any other comments? Hey, so um, Sneha, yeah, I just want to add, you just meant. Sorry, go ahead. Oh. Okay, sorry, Catherine, it's Carl. Uh, I, I echo everything that everyone has said about its goals and objectives, and the establishment of those in projects is an absolute necessity. The other thing I think is an absolute necessity, and I've always, I, I've harped on this in the past, and it's fallen on deaf ears, but I keep trying to push the point. If you're going to base a program on SBU, which I think is a, at least a, a, a way of possibly evaluating projects and ranking them. If you're going to base that program on that, it's intellectually dishonest to not go back and rescore after these things have been built. So if you're going to be basing your, your calculation only on what is proposed and not go back and then look at it after it's been complete, I, I think smacked of this sort of intellectual dishonesty. And I think that the opportunities to learn from that are far greater if you go back and do the rescoring than it is outweighing the legal ramifications of what it means to buy up land to just base the calculation on what was proposed. Anna or Anne, are you still um, on the phone? Do you want to answer that, or um, what do you guys think? I, I think Anna, I'm still on the phone, but I don't exactly know how to address that. Uh, I'll definitely <laughs> take it back for discussion. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate okay. the comments, okay. though. Yeah, good comments. Um, I think a lot of people would, would, would agree that there needs to be some follow-up. Um, so I was going to pick on Sneha um, and Sarah again for, and any other folks, about like a future science work group about carbon sequestration and how to use sites for uh, mitigation of um, climate change impacts, so greenhouse gas. Um, sequestration possibilities with some of these projects, anything that we know about that and how could we integrate that kind of stuff into our monitoring going forward. So if people have um, speakers that could address that, that they would suggest, that would be awesome. If you want to send them to me, that would be great. But that could be a future topic of the science work group if you guys are okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. That's like a great topic to talk about. <laughs> I could use a like that, yeah. 